Well, hello again. Hope you're ready to uh, continue in this new adventure with me in the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're in the second chapter, and today we're going to, uh, this evening, whenever you're watching this, uh, we're going to be uh, looking at verses 7 through 12. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 12. Before I start reading them, you know, the, these, the Apostle Paul is beginning from, from the from the first verse of the second chapter, he's really just describing his own part and how he came to the people of Thessalonica. And in that description, he's also describing how that anybody who's called into the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and is a leader of God's people setting up and, and, and uh, shepherding churches what should be their attitude? What should be their conduct? How should they go about themselves? Um, and so this is a really, really good place to see some of the true characteristics that God is looking for and that pe God's people should look for in their leaders. But obviously, it also brings into play the interaction between God's leadership amongst His people in His churches and the people themselves. And so we're going to kind of get into that a little bit and show some of the things that are, that are truly amazing uh, that, that are, and unique about the leadership of, uh, and the, the interaction of God's leaders and His people in His churches. Okay, so let's start, start up reading verses 7, and we'll read down through verse 12. I'm going to read it in the King James first, and then we'll probably go and refer to the, to the Amplified Bible as we go back and talk about some of these things. So it says this, But we were gentle among you. Okay, we, the Paul and those who are with him, we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, our lives, because you were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children, that you should walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. Okay. So the Apostle Paul is um, calling to their remembrance how he conducted himself when he came to them at Thessalonica. And we've already learned that he really didn't get to spend as much time as he wanted to there. There's some discrepancies about how long he was able to be there. Some people think it was short of three weeks. That's probably a little short, a few months, whatever. But it wasn't long enough in his estimation as to what he wanted to do before he basically got ran out of town again by the Jews. And so when he says in verse 7, we were gentle among you. This is another, okay, you remember? He's telling them, you remember how I acted, how I conducted myself? We were gentle among you as a nurse cherishes her children. Now, literally, this is talking about a mother nourishing her baby with her own mother's milk. And this picture that he is painting here, uh, you know, th there's, a, there's a lot of things that go into this that really uh, picture a, a very cherished <laughs> sort of picture. Look at, in the Amplified Bible, it says this, you, but we behaved gently when we were among you like a devoted mother nursing and cherishing her own children. Now, those of you that are, that are ladies and have had children and have had the opportunity to breastfeed, uh, I don't have to say anything to you. You know what a unique experience that is. 
you know that in order to breastfeed your child, you have to hold it close. And that, that, that closeness creates, in essence, what medical science referred to as bonding. Now, you, you can bond with your kids. Uh, you know, you don't have to breastfeed your kids to bond with your kids. You can bond in, in other ways. But this is uh, what perhaps the most natural way for a, a mother to bond with her children as she's holding the child close to her chest and allowing the child to be nourished with her own mother's milk that has everything in it that that child needs at that moment in its life. And so we're really talking about now this, again, this back and forth. And Paul is saying, listen, I was like a nursing mother to you. I was holding you close to me. And I was giving you this spiritual nourishment of the milk of the word. And in fact, the Apostle Paul uh, talks about that in other places. Um, and Peter does also. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. This is something that, that Peter mentions in, in uh, the first two verses of 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envy and evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, the spiritual milk. That's what he's talking about. Uh, <clears throat> that you may grow thereby. So when, when the baby's uh, an infant, that's what they need. And it has all the ingredients to allow them to begin their growth journey in becoming a, ultimately, a, a full-grown ad, uh, adult person. Apostle Paul says that. You know what? In the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have somebody who's truly been, and I think I talked about this last week, don't go into the ministry. If you're, if you're thinking about going into the ministry, don't go into it unless you know you are called of God to do this. Because it is so challenging. Because it, has, uh, it sets the bar so high. Because it's not just a job. And I don't want to degrade you know, other, other occupations at all. But truly, being in the ministry is something that is uh, you know, kind of set different, unique from that. It, you're not just punching a clock. You're not just performing duties. You're not just doing things that are written out in a job description or whatever. It becomes a part of who you are. And you invest your life into the lives of God's people when you go into the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so part of that is feeding. And, and in the beginning, as the, as the Apostle Paul did with the Thessalonians, it's feeding them the milk. As a mother provides her own mother's milk to her child. And in that you are literally sharing your lives together. Look at what verse, verse 8 uh, says of our text. We were so affectionately desirous of you. Amplified Bible. Verse 8. So being thus tenderly and affectionately desirous of you, we continued to share with you not only God's good news, the gospel, but also our own lives. King James says soul. Greek word is suke. It's, and that just literally means your soul is your life. That part of you that you don't see, that part of you that is not the body, the real you, you invest your very soul into the lives of God's people. You share with them the gospel. You give them your own lives, uh, uh, for you had become so very dear to us. I challenge any true minister who's been called into the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ to do it without becoming vulnerable in this sense. Because you care about the people. You want to see the, the, the things that can be experienced in the life of every one of God's people. You want to see them grow. You want to see their faith become stronger. You want to see them accomplish things for the Lord. You want to see them be able to bear up under life's burdens, under life's challenges, because we all have them. Everybody has the kinds of things that can weigh down on us, and you want to see them be able to, to, to bear up under those things. And even in the midst of trials and tribulations in life, 
You want to see them even thrive and, and increase their faith and their knowledge and their confidence and their willingness to put themselves out there for the Lord. So we are sharing in the gospel together, and that's what Paul is telling the Thessalonican people. When you do this, you become vulnerable because you open up your life to them. And they see some of the things that you have to deal with as a minister in your life. And uh, very, very recently, I've had people come to me and say, thank you for sharing some things about that happened in me and my life and some being honest with people and some, some challenges that I have in my life. And they said, thank you for sharing that. It makes, makes it easier for me to understand that you're going through some of the things, same things that I'm going through. And that's the truth. We all have these things in our life. And if you're going to be a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be vulnerable to that. You're going to share your heart with the people that you love. You're going to be accountable because you then you put yourself out there and people get invested in your life and they're going to be coming to you asking you how you're doing. And believe me, there are sometimes, I'm not saying that you need to stop and give people a 30-minute spiel when they come up to say how you're doing. You know, a lot of times, oh, yeah, I'm doing great. But you know what? There are some times, and I've had this happen, people come up to me, and when they ask me how I'm doing, I know it's not just a flippant, how's things going today? They want to know. And you know what? It's hard sometimes. It's hard time sometimes to share the things that are really going on in your life. But you know what? You get into the ministry, you open yourself up to that. You become vulnerable to that. And you need to, to some extent, be willing to tell people how things really are going. But guess what happens after that then? You get the support. God's ministers need to be supportive of God's people. So this whole idea of a, of a nursing mother sharing her mother's milk is a, is a real supportive thing. It's a warm thing. It's, it's holding them close. It's making them feel secure. That's what you need to do for people in the beginning as they are starting out their new life in Jesus Christ. They're going to need all of that they can get. Don't think that you can ever over-love or over-support uh, somebody else. You, you, you just can't do it enough of it. And there's nothing wrong with doing that whatsoever. And the Apostle Paul says, hey, we were like that nursing mother doing that for you guys. But then he continues in uh, verse 9. Let me read that out of the Amplified. In verse 9 he says, You recall our hard toil and struggles, brethren. We worked night and day and plied our trade in order not to be a burden to any of you for our support while we proclaim the glad tidings, the gospel of God, to you. So, Paul was a tent maker. He worked with leather. And when he came to Thessalonica, he had enough time to set his business up. What probably was happening is, he was applying his trade during the daytime, and in the evenings, he was ministering to God's people in the church that had just been formed at Thessalonica, working night and day. Why did he do that? Because he did want, not want to represent any kind of an extra burden to those new believers in Jesus Christ in this pagan city that Thessalonica was. He didn't want to give any, uh, you know, uh, create any kind of a dynamic going on where he was, uh, was taking from the people. And in fact, he was giving of the people. So now... Here's, here's a point that we need to, to mention. This does not mean, and the Apostle Paul has talk, talked about this in other places, this does not mean that the minister uh, should not be supported by the church. In fact, scriptures clearly teach that the ministers should be supported by the church. But Paul's situation in the first century, planting churches in these pagan societies and cultures in which he was going to, he chose to forego that right which he said he had in order so that people would know he's not after their money. He's not after, you know, uh, anything of any ill-gotten gain or whatever. 
I wish I could sit here and tell you that there, that there are every minister that's in any kind of a, you know, a church setting or a ministerial uh, setting is in it for the right reasons, but you and I both know that's not true. And sometimes there are guys that are in it for the money. They're in it to take advantage of people. I heard some st- statistic that was not new. In fact, it might have been about 10 years ago that there are a certain segment of, of uh, Christian churches that uh, are sold into this, pros- what we refer to as the prosperity gospel, and that 90% of these people believe if they give their money that God is going to give back to them and they're going to prosper in this life. And guess what? Almost the same percentage of people in those ministries are living underneath the poverty line. Who is taken advantage of many times in these kinds of ministries? It's the very people that don't have anything enough to give already. And yet they give what, whatever they can, even as they're living below the poverty line, believing that they're going to get a check in the mail, believing that some great you know, blessing from God is going to come down from heaven and they're going to prosper in life. And it's a sad thing to see that, that kind of a dynamic going on. While the leaders of the ministry are living in their mansions with their fancy cars and their jet airplanes and everything else, it makes me sick to my stomach. So Paul is saying, hey, we didn't do any of that. We came to you, we worked. We worked all day and then we taught you by night. We worked all day and we fellowshiped with you by night. We worked all day and we shared our lives with you. We gave ourselves to you. And guess what? They were doing the same thing towards Paul. And that bond as the nursing mother, that bonding experience is what gave them the confidence to stick with this new faith that the Apostle Paul was talking about, this new religion of Christianity at that time. So even though Paul in other places talked about the minister's right to be expect to be paid, to be expect to be supported, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, and you'll read some of those statements. That's very clear. He chose not to do that because he wanted them to know that he was not doing this for any other reason other than he cared, he loved them. All right, verse 10. Let's read that out of the Amplified. He says, you are witnesses. You notice he says this over and over again. You guys know, you are my witnesses. And then he also says, God also is my witness. So there, there, there's corroborating a witness here. What? You are my witnesses, yes, and God also how unworldly and upright and blameless was our behavior toward you believers. Who? Uh, okay, so, boy, this is the great, great challenge for the minister. And that is to live a life that presents the right example to other people. And to sometimes forego personal liberties, personal freedoms that they know they have so that they can maintain that kind of upright character in the eyes of God's people that they are leading. What's the bottom line? You need to live a life that you are set apart from the culture of the world, from the culture that Satan is controlling, that that Satan has the influence about. People need to be able to see your life and, and see, oh, you know what? This person is living differently. They're living by a different standard. They're showing me that there is another way to live, that I don't have to be overcome by the temporal things of the world, the material things of the world, and care only about what's in it for me in this life. There are other ways to live. There are other ways to conduct yourself based on more eternal, permanent principles, uh, on, on more eternal, permanent promises that God ultimately gives to his people. And so he set, the Apostle Paul set this courageous example towards them of living a life that would not cause any occasion for anybody else to stumble. Uh, And boy, that that is so, so important. Uh, I'm not perfect in this. I don't know of any minister in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that's perfect in this. 
But it's something that I constantly have to remind myself. Be the example. Be the person that uh, shows people, yeah, you can live by and through the promises of God rather than by the, you know, the enticements of the world. Don't live a worldly life. Live a heavenly life. And then in verse 11, we come to a little more of a, of a serious thing. So in, in verse 7, he talked about mom, mother's milk, mom. In verse 11, he now talks about dad. Now, if you were privileged to grow up in a family with both a mother and father and a mother and father that loved you, you probably saw differences in how mom uh, does things and how dad did things, right? And so he says in verse 11, the Amplified, he says, For you know how as a father, dealing with his children, we used to exhort each of you personally, stimulating and encouraging and charging you. So, a father tends to be a little bit more straightforward. A father tends to be somebody that maybe doesn't you know, cloak everything in all the sweetness and niceness. A father tends to be somebody that tells you like it is. Well, you know what? The ministers to God's people not only need to be like the nursing mother, they also need to be like the straightforward father. Well, man, I can do one or the other. How can I do both? That's the challenge, right? Of, of being in the ministry. Be, I, to think about it this way. A true minister leading God's people needs to be willing to tell them exactly what they need to know when they need to know it. A, that minister needs to give those people what they need when they need it. If they need a pat on the back, great. If they need a swift kick in the behind, <laughs> They need it. It's not, it's not always pleasurable. So, you know, the Bible talks about the differences in, way, in, in which we, we help each other in our Christian lives. One word that is used is admonish, Admo warn, admonish. You know what, then that's exactly it. Hey, brother, you need to be careful with that. That's going to lead you someplace that you don't want to go. Admonish, warn, give them the danger. You need to slow down there. Think about what you're doing. The other is exhortation. Lift them up. Hey, you're doing great in this area. Keep it up. You're only going to uh, receive the, the, the blessings of God more and more as you give yourself to Him in these areas. You're doing great. And you know what? Generally speaking, Paul was exhorting the Thessalonians because they were doing a good job. They weren't perfect, but they were doing a good job. So here he's talking about as a father does these things. A father gives the people what they need, when they need it, even if sometimes that might even be in the form of a rebuke, an admonishment, or an exhortation. Um, and then the other thing that he doesn't talk about here, but I think is a direct correlation. The mom gives the mother's milk. We saw how Peter says, desire the sincere milk of the word. But you know what? The Lord doesn't want you to stay only on milk. He wants you to get to the meat of his word, of his, the awareness of what his word and will is for your life. In Hebrews chapter 5, the writer of Hebrews talks about that to these Jewish Christians that were wavering in their faith. And he told them, listen, you, need, you should have already been off the milk of the word and onto the meat, but you still can't take the meat because you have not grown yet to the extent that you can take the meat of the Word. There are some things in God's Word that hit us right between the eyes. And when we read those things, if we're not mature enough, we can sometimes say, ah, no, that's terrible. No, I can't believe that or whatever, and turn our back on it. But we need to grow in our faith and our trust in God so that when we do then get into the meat of the Word and we see some things, we'll go, wow, yeah, I can see that. And I need to do better in that, in that regard. And so they need to, you need to go from the milk to the meat. 
And I think that is part and parcel with what Paul is talking about here, conducting himself both as a mother and as a father so that people can receive all the truth of God uh, that they need when they need it. And then he finally ends up in verse 12 talking about how they need to be living worthy. Verse 12 says, He wanted them to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glorious blessedness into which true believers will enter after Christ's return. You are a citizen of heaven. You already have been granted the promises of God regarding the everlasting eternal life. It's up to us uh, how many rewards we may take with us into that time, but that, that has already been granted to us. You are a child of God. You are a citizen of heaven. You need to conduct yourself in that manner so that when people see you, just like when they see the minister, you know what? This person's different. This person is going through life with a different set of values, a different set of standards, with a different, perhaps even better, awareness of what's really, truly important. Showing the world what's really valuable, not just the material things, the temporary things, but the eternal things of God. That's what Paul wanted for the Thessalonian people, and that's what any true minister wants for those that he's ministering to. You know, a lot of times they'll show pictures of United States presidents, and they'll show a picture of them and what they look like especially two-term presidents, right? Eight years. They'll show a picture of them what they look like when they began their presidential term and what they look like at the end. And many times, it's very, very easy to see the pretty profound difference in their physical appearance. So the Abraham Lincoln is an example of that. Some of the pictures they have of him in the beginning and at the end, wow. And and they do that to show the harsh reality of the burden of being the leader of the free world, the president of the United States, what that brings into it. I'm here to tell you, the ministry is no different. If you're doing it for the right reasons, in the right way, it cannot uh, help but affect your life. From the human perspective, it wears you down because you can't just set it aside. You can't just say, you know what, okay, I've done my duty, you know, it's it's Sunday night, that's it. I've done done my duty, I'm not even going to think about uh, anything else anymore, you know, and believe me, I'm going to be completely, absolutely honest with you. I try to do that. I try when I, when I get home uh, after being, you know, in the office or when I get home from Sundays or whatever, I try to just set everything aside and just, you know, so I can decompress, so I can relax. And you know what? It doesn't work. I'm constantly thinking about my next lesson, my next sermon. I'm thinking about the people that perhaps have come and talked to me and the issues of their life. Uh, and it, it, it wears on you. It, it really does. Now, I'm not saying this to say woe is me. What I'm saying this is that, remember this sharing of the gospel is a two-way street. A true minister of God is going to give the, himself to God's people. God's people need to give themselves to the minister. You need to wrap your arms around your pastor. You need to be able to, to say, I'm with you. I'm supporting you. If there's anything you ever need, or more importantly sometimes, no, don't say, if there's anything you need, look them straight in the eye and say, what do you need? I want to get it for you. And if you've developed the kind of relationship that Paul had with the Thessalonians, you're going to begin to uh, be willing to be vulnerable. You're going to be willing to um, be accountable. 
but you're also then going to experience the support that you have between God's people and his leaders. I hope some of this has made some sense to you and has been um, uh, helpful for you. The Apostle Paul is going to be getting into some pretty amazing things as we continue on this book. But the reason he's able to do that is because of this relationship. He loved them so much, and he, he wanted them to continue to grow in the Lord. And that's what God wants for you, and that's what Pastor Ken and myself want for each of you in the ministry of, of uh, Orchard Avenue Baptist Church. We want to see you continue to grow in the Lord and get stronger in your faith for him. God bless you. We'll see you next time.